Um, okay, uh, so uh, thank you again, uh, all of you, uh, for uh, uh, for coming to these lectures. Uh, and once again, uh, good evening, or uh, if you're in some other part of the world, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Uh, and uh, yesterday uh, we discussed uh, you know, uh, several property. We had some general introduction, and we discussed several properties of uh, the two-point function. Uh, so today, uh, I thought we would continue with that discussion. Uh, but before we continue the discussion, uh, if there are any questions from yesterday which were left over, which we couldn't discuss, uh, this might be a good time to you know uh, look at some leftover questions, and then we could start and go on to uh, other things we'd like to discuss. Uh, Chandramul, you can hear me clearly and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay, it's good. Okay, okay. So I'm assuming there are, there are, there are no there are no questions. Uh, if there are uh, questions, if if they occur to you later, uh, please feel free to adopt the same protocol that we did yesterday uh, and go ahead and ask them. Uh, by the way, I should mention that uh, we uploaded yesterday's lecture on on YouTube. Uh, you can see it there, and uh, today we'll upload the lecture as well uh, after the the class ends. Uh, I realized it probably takes maybe a few hours uh, before we can uh, upload things. Uh, but we'll try and do it uh, before the end of the day in, in India, at least today. Okay, uh, so let me just briefly recap uh, what we were doing yesterday. Uh, so yesterday, uh, we had this uh, long discussion of uh, the two-point function uh, of a scalar field uh, when these points x1 and x2 are very close to each other uh, and when the distance between them was much smaller uh, than the curvature scale or the inverse mass scale in the problem, uh, where it was much larger uh, than uh, you know, the Planck scale or some other UV scale in the problem. And I said at the end, although uh, we didn't make precise, uh, that uh, you know, we could use this two-point function uh, to extract in some unambiguous and very nice way uh, the form of uh, some right-moving modes on opposite sides of the horizon, uh, which I said which I said, uh, you know, we have some right moving modes on this side of the horizon and some right moving modes on the other side of the horizon. Uh, and I wrote down some very schematic expression last time, uh, which said that, you know, we could extract these modes roughly by doing some, in by taking the derivative and then by doing the integral on this side, u, and uh, doing something similar on the other side Uh, but these are, I uh, emphasize just approximate expressions. And uh, what I'd like to do today is make these more precise uh, and come up with some nice answer uh, for what we've been promising about the form of these modes across the horizon, which I entangled in a nice way. Uh, so I should say as a preview for today's lecture uh, that, uh, you know, we're going to go through some calculations. Uh, the calculations might seem that, you know, uh, they might seem to be uh, lengthy or tedious, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, we're going to get some uh, nice answer uh, and uh, uh, you know that 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 nice answer is something which uh, which will be uh, simple and and uh, and easy uh, to remember. Uh, so um, uh, just one second. Uh, hmm. Sorry, uh, generally I have I have a quick question. Uh, yeah, we, we should be on speaker view, but uh, for some reason uh, it's still on. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter, right? Uh, hopefully it doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah, I, uh, ho yeah, hopefully it okay. doesn't matter. Um, okay. Yeah, fine. Okay. Like, I, I think I can share. I, I can see your shared screen on any case. Yeah, you can see, but can you not see me? Yeah, I can see you as well. Okay. In the fine. active okay, speaker. Then, then, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, my, yeah. my video is uh, off for myself. Okay, fine. Anyway, doesn't okay. matter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, so uh, uh, so okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, you know, we're going to try and make uh, these expressions more precise today. And uh, let me just try and say, you know, why it is uh, that we want to make these expressions precise. You see, the moment you look at an, an expression of this kind, you see that, you know, if you're going to do an integral of the field, which is going to be over large values of u, so, you know, if, if you're going to do an integral of, of the field uh, for some, so remember u runs in this direction, uh, and we try and integrate the field for very large values of u, uh, then it's clear that everything we said about the two-point function, which we are going to use to derive the form of these modes, uh, will not be valid any longer. Uh, so it's clear that whatever integral we need to do, whatever the precise form of this expression is going to be, uh, the precise form of this expression has to be something uh, that involves an integral over only a small range in u, 
uh, where once again small is defined with respect to the other length scales in the theory in that it's small compared to the curvature scale but large compared uh, to the uv scale in the theory okay uh, so to make that precise uh, what we are what we are going to do uh, is we are going to introduce a smearing function okay? so we'll introduce a smearing function uh, which we will denote by t of u okay now we're never going to need uh, in in anything that we do uh, the precise form of uh, this smearing function. So we are not going to ever write down what the smearing function is, uh, but we are going to use some general properties of what the smearing function is. Um, so of course, uh, you could redo everything uh, we are doing uh, just by uh, you know, putting in some specific smearing function uh, that has the properties uh, that we are going to demand, uh, but uh, we are never going to need the explicit form of the smearing function uh, except uh, some general properties. So what are the properties we need from the smearing function? So the first property we need from the smearing function is that this T of u dies off smoothly. Yeah, u goes to zero. Okay. So it has support in some range which we can call ul to u h. Okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce a, some amount of notation here, uh, but you know what we are doing is something very simple and intuitive. So please don't get worried by the notation. And if something confuses you, please stop and ask. Uh, so it has support in some in some range which is between u l and u h, uh, where both of these properties, uh, both of these numbers, you know, have uh, the property that you know this is much smaller than the curvature scale, and as usual, the u v scale is much smaller uh, than both this uh and ul but in addition we also have that uh by ul is much larger than one okay so we have two cutoffs so the smearing function has support uh between some ul to uh, uh but the ratio between uh and ul is very large okay uh, so for instance uh, you know if you were to measure something in terms of the curvature scale it could be that UL is uh, you know, 10 to the minus uh, 10 into the curvature scale, uh, whereas uh, UH uh, is uh, 10 to the minus five into the curvature scale. And therefore the ratio between UH and UL is 10 to the five, uh, but both of them are much smaller than the curvature scale. Okay? So another way of thinking about it is that this T of U has support uh, for a large range of log U uh, near log U equal to minus infinity. Okay, that's another way of thinking about this. Uh, uh, both QH second... and UL are on the same side? Uh, so both QL and QH have the same. Uh, both UL and UH are on the same side? Um, uh, on equals... the same, yeah, right now, yeah, that's right. Thank you. So at this point, both uh, in the convention we're using, both UL and UH are larger than zero. Uh, at some point, we, we might also write down T of minus U, uh, but I'm going to define the smearing function uh, to be some function which has support only for positive U. And uh, later, uh, I will. I might write down t of minus u, and that function will have obviously the same properties, but on the other side. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay, the second property we are going to need uh, is just a property about how we are going to normalize this t of u. Okay. So the normalization we are going to use is that t of u squared okay, into d of u by u is equal to two pi. Okay, uh, that's all we are going to need about about t of u. Okay. So the way we should we should think about uh, and and the well the third property is that t of u is flat for a large range range of log u, okay. And notice that this you know this expression I have here d of u by u is in fact d of log u, okay. Uh, so one way to think about uh, what this function uh, t of u is doing is uh, we have, if I was to plot log of u, uh, I could divide it by, by, some, by some other scale, but let me just write log of u. It's not very precise. It's a dimension full quantity, but we could divide it by something else to make it dimensionless. Uh, and uh, if you have minus infinity here, so this t of u has some support over a very, very, very long range and it dies off smoothly near its endpoints. Okay. So it's a flat function, 
and it has, so this is T of u, and this is log of u. Okay? So it's a flat function. It's flat for a long range of log of u, uh, and it dies off smoothly uh, near log of u equal to minus infinity, which is u equal to zero, and it dies off smoothly also uh, when u becomes uh, uh, which in this part is somewhere here. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's the smearing function we're going to introduce. And so what we're doing is, you know, we, we have some notation, but really, uh, if you have any confusion about that, just think in terms of this picture uh, that we have uh, for T of u. Okay? okay. The second thing we need to do is, uh, you know, we, we are going to, uh, we wrote down this integral, which was some integral, once again, let me write down, which was this integral, And I emphasize every time I write something like this right now, it's still an approximate expression. Uh, but I didn't specify what I was doing in the transverse directions. Uh, so this, this field phi is defined not only at a value of u and v, uh, it's also defined at a value of these d minus one other dimensions, these transverse dimensions. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate over the volume which we'll just call V okay, uh, in the transverse uh, direction as well. Okay. Uh, this V once again has the property that, you know, it's, it's much smaller than the curvature scale. So I'm just integrating by a small amount uh, in the transverse direction as well. Okay. Uh, sorry, just one second. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so this is, this is my volume V. And once again, uh, we don't specify what V is, uh, but this V is, uh, you know, uh, the V is, is something which is much smaller uh, than a cube of uh, the curvature scale uh, to the power D minus one. Uh, not, not a cube, a hypercube of the curvature scale. Okay, very good. So now we're in a position uh, to define, uh, to make this expression more precise. So this is an approximate expression. We can write down a more precise expression. Uh, so now we're in a position to do that. And let me write that down. So the precise mode we're going to need is is this okay. du phi at some value of u v equal to zero okay there are these uh oh sorry let me use v o l uh to to disambiguate it from uh, the coordinate v uh, sorry i was saying v but uh this volume i'm going to write as v o l just to disambiguate it from uh the coordinate v okay um minus u to the minus i omega naught. So there was a question earlier about whether t of u has support only for positive u, and indeed it does, but here I've written down t of minus u, okay. d of u, d d minus one by alpha, and square root of phi omega naught v o l. Uh, so now uh, 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 this is this is some integral, uh, which is some integral over some finite range uh, in uh, u, uh, and that finite range is controlled by the smearing function that we have here that we've inserted here. Notice this is the smearing function, okay. and notice, however, that because the smearing function is flat for a large range of log of u, uh, there is some correspondence between this approximate expression. And this expression that I wrote down here, okay. uh, I'm calling this frequency omega naught. Uh, so notice that there's some, some dependence on omega naught because later we'll have another omega. Uh, so I'm not going to write down this omega naught. I should have written down really A of omega naught, uh, but I'm going to keep that dependence tacit. And notice that there's a correspondence between the approximate expression and this expression here. Uh, but other than that, this integral is now a well-defined integral. It's really a short distance integral near u equal to zero. Correspondingly, on the other side of the horizon, we can define another mode, which we'll call A tilde, okay, which is defined the same way, except uh, this, by the way, is U. So this is U for universe. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my handwriting is so bad. I just want to emphasize this is not V. Okay, so this is U for universe. Uh, and on the other side, you can define a similar expression. That expression is defined at a slightly different value of v. Okay, it's not defined on exactly the same point of v. It's defined a slightly different value of v, and this will actually be important for us later uh, when we, uh, you know, when we compute the commutators of these modes. 
uh, but by defining it on a slightly different value of v, uh, we ensure that the support of this a and a tilde is always space-like. So these modes are defined by doing an integral on space-like separated intervals. Okay, so I hope this expression uh, for both A and A tilde is clear. Uh, remember, uh, we, as I said, we're doing an integral in a small range in U, in a small range in the transverse direction. Uh, the range over which we're doing the integral in the transverse directions is over some volume, which is, uh, you know, DOL. Uh, we've divided by square root of the volume. There are some other normalization factors like these ones, uh, which are some, you know, pi and omega naught and so on. Uh, which it just meant uh, for convenience, uh, you could define some modes without these factors and you'd get some different commutation relations between them. We have the smearing function here, which ensures that you know we have support over a small range of u. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, this du phi uh, that we had last time. And we are not integrating in v at all, but we have separated these modes a little bit on opposite sides of v. So one way to picturize what we're doing, uh, maybe I can draw a diagram, uh, is you know here's our Here's a line. This is the line, which is u equal to zero, okay? and uh, this is u smaller than zero on this side. This is u larger than zero on this side. Okay? Uh, we have v equal to zero somewhere here, so maybe this is v equal to zero, okay? and uh, we do an integral uh, of this kind uh, for negative u. So this is the support of A. And we do a similar integral on the other side, at a slightly different value of V. So you might, uh, that's not good. Uh, let me try again. My drawing skills are somewhat limited as you can see, but this is the support of A tilde. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, it, these expressions look complicated, uh, but we're never going to need uh, these precise expressions. We're just going to derive some very simple properties of these A's and A tildes. Uh, those simple properties are going to be very beautiful and very nice, uh, but you know, to make sure that those properties come out correctly, we need some of these intermediate uh, steps uh, to make sure that you know, uh, we are doing things correctly. Uh, but I hope the intuitive picture of how these modes A and A tilde is defined is clear. Uh, are there any questions about this? Uh, I will uh, go on now to derive and do some calculations with these modes. And as I said, yeah. there'll be, I promise there'll be a nice simple answer in the end. Uh, but at this okay. point, are there any questions about, about uh, how these modes are defined? Yeah, I think there are some in the chat, but I see many here. of them are answered already. <laughs> the smearing function, uh, I think it's in... Is T the stress tensor? Yeah, no, uh, T is the smearing function. Thank you, that was already answered. Why can't we just combine? Uh, yeah, you could just combine U to the I omega as a question of, so one question is why can't we combine U to the I omega into T, T of U? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, it's true that, you know, U, U, U to the I omega naught de depends on omega naught, but I could, I could define some F of omega naught. It's just a question of convenience. Um, okay, uh, is there any other question? Um, um, yeah, the, the, the y integral is uh, over all of the y sphere. Uh, no, uh, the y integral is not over all of the y. The y integral is over the, uh, in, this is in the transverse coordinates. So I'm integrating in the vicinity of a point. I mean, there's some transverse thing which I can't draw, uh, but I'm only integrating in a small hypercube about this origin. Okay, so I'm integrating in a small region and that's this VOL that's appearing here. So the y integral okay. is not over all y. It's only over a small range of y's. Okay, and I think there's a raised hand, maybe. Yeah, please go on, yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, can I, uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I just wanted a clarification maybe on this uh, v is equal to minus epsilon, like what goes wrong if you take it to be zero? And uh, the second question, I guess, is like, uh, is T of U on the, for the A tilde more uh, similar in profile to how you drew it for T of minus U or is there some, maybe no, these T of minus U is, 
exactly the same as t, it's literally t of minus u. So that's the first answer. Uh, the second answer is, you know, it's important that these modes are space-like separated. Uh, so, you know, there's some light cone you can draw here. The reason for doing this minus epsilon is that there's some light cone you can draw here. Okay. Uh, so there's a light cone maybe at epsilon by two so that uh, these uh, two things. So I, I just drew this, this line, this green line. I, I hope you can see the green line. So that the mm -hmm. support of A and A tilde is just on opposite sides of the light cone. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, that ensures that these, these two modes are space-like separated. It'll be important for us uh, because these modes are going to uh, commute in okay. quantum field theory and curved space time. And that's I why see. it's defined as V equal to minus epsilon. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Surat. Yeah. Uh, uh, I missed this point. So uh, we wanted the uh, smearing function to restrict us near uh, uh, for small u. Why did we take lo log u in all our uh, conditions? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, because we want the smearing function also to have support uh, for the large range of log of u. You know, we want the smearing function to be kind of to be flat for a large range of log of u. Uh, so uh, I you know, uh, so uh, that's why we we wanted log of u in a condition. So you know. The smearing, it'll be important a little bit later, uh, but mm -hmm. the fact that the smearing function is is almost flat in log of u, but it's not exactly flat because it has to die off at its edges, uh, but it's almost flat in log of u. So, I mean, so that that's why we, you see, it can't be almost flat in u because we know that we have to have a small range. We are integrating only over a small range in u. Right, but right, right, right. Almost flat in log of u because there's infinite amount of log of u near u equal to zero. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. Are there other questions? Yeah, I think okay. one from uh, yeah. Varun in the chat. He's asking if uh, what if t of u is not flat but Gaussian or something. Uh, it, it could be, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to make our life complicated. We will choose. Uh, we will. It's a demand we make of t of u is that it should be something which is flat over a large range of log of u. Uh, if you choose some other t of u which doesn't have this property, the final answers that we get won't be nice. So we we want the final answers to be nice. Okay. Um, uh, so one last question. So when you say A and A tilde are space-like separated, you mean every point in the support of one is space-like separated? Sorry, Tony, if, if that's Tony, I can't hear you. Other? Can you please speak up, please? Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, could you uh, could could you explain what it means to say that A and A tilde are space-like separated? Yeah, it means that uh, you know we're integrating. So this this integral is, I mean, it should is the is the region over which we're integrating A, right? This is the support of A in that. We integrate the field over uh, this wavy region. It's not actually a wavy region. It's actually a straight line, although the, the smearing function uh, with which we are integrating it is, is oscillating. This u is oscillating. Uh, and uh, so we integrate the field over one region uh, to get a. We integrate the field over another region to get a tilde. The regions that we're integrating the field over are space-like separated. And oh, okay. that's going to be important to ensure that the commutator of a tilde is zero if this underlying field obeys microcausality. Because we integrate phi over one region, you, if you take phi and you integrate in two regions, uh, and those regions are space-like separated, then you know those uh, uh, operators, whatever you get, uh, are going to commute with each other. That's why it's important. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, the smearing function is. Uh, some uh, uh, something which uh, we are constructing smearing function because we do not know the ultraviolet uh, features of uh, correlators at very small distance and uh, we hope that it is somehow regular regularized by in a quantum theory of gravity and uh, its substitution in semi-classical regime is the smearing function it's not so deep actually it's the fact that you know we just want uh, you know, we want to be always within this regime where, uh, you know, we are not going very far away from the surface u equal to zero. You know, we want to use these short distance properties of the two point function we, we demanded yesterday. And so we don't want to go very far away from u equal to zero. So I've just chosen some function that kind of dies off smoothly at, at, at some small value of u. Uh, and, you know, it dies off smoothly near u equal to zero. And so that I can just define some mode that's smooth. Uh, it's not not some. I mean, it's not something very deep. It's just the fact that I always want to be close to this u equal to zero surface. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. But uh, I'm sorry for asking this question. But uh, uh, what, uh, is it some procedure like the renormalization that we can always uh, uh, introduce mirroring function by hand? 
I mean, uh, it seems like a construction we are doing by hand so that the A and A tilde have the right commutator, like the that of a free field theory. But uh, uh, you see, I, I want to extract some degrees of freedom from the underlying field. Uh, this field phi has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, right? So this field phi uh, has has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, now, I want to extract uh, from this field phi uh, some degrees of freedom that are nicely behaved and that are nicely entangled near u equal to zero. Uh, this is something we do quite often, right? When we write down creation and annihilation operators, we integrate phi with some plane wave and we say, you know, we want to call this a creation operator. Uh, that's our choice, right? There's some field phi, which has some uh, lots of complicated degrees of freedom. And then we, we are choosing to do an integral of phi in a certain way so as to extract a particular degree of freedom on both sides of the horizon, which will have nice properties. Okay, uh, but there can be, uh, okay, I got the point. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so the uh, first- I have a doubt. Yeah. So, uh, so had, had you not turned off u very far away, turned off t of u very far away from the horizon, uh, you, you could still construct wave modes which are uh, near the horizon, similar to this A of omega or A of A tilde, but far away they are different, right? Where my my smearing function really extends far away from your view. Yeah, if, you, if you hold, if you hold, if you hold the, the question for a minute, uh, it'll become clear why we need to switch it off. So maybe let, let me just come back. No, to no. Uh, my, my my question is like, how do I uh, how do I qualitatively distinguish between these modes? Like a more physical way of, uh, as in, I would have expected a, a full decomposition of modes would lead me to integrate over like full extent of the space time. But like you seem to be doing a, a orthogonal decomposition, just looking at the close horizon, close u equal to zero region. Right I'm now curious, no what is a qualitative difference? Right now there's no orthogonal decomposition. You see, there's an infinite number of simple harmonic oscillators that sit inside the field phi. Uh, you, can, you can extract uh, uh, simple harmonic oscillators by doing integrals with plane waves, or you can extract simple harmonic oscillators by doing integrals with other kinds of functions. Uh, we, you know, uh, the, the physics that we want to get at is the fact that near this horizon u equal to zero, there is some local entanglement. There are some degrees of freedom which live very close to the horizon, which are very entangled with each other in a certain universal way. And that's why we are switching off this T of u. You know, we want to zoom in or focus on those universally entangled degrees of freedom across this u equal to zero. Uh, so that's the reason we don't want, you know, we don't, there are many other things one could define, uh, but, uh, the, you know, we are going to show that if you, Take this definition that's written on the board right now, uh, that these degrees of freedom will have, you know, some nice entanglement. So, so can you think that this A and A tilde are some kind of coarse grain field modes because they, they don't distinguish between modes really, which uh, far away turn off or something. As in, you have a weighted T of U, some kind of weight, right? They're like not coarse grain. I mean, they're just defined close to U equal to zero. It's not like. You know, uh, I, I, I really don't want to care about what happens to the degrees of freedom far away from the horizon. So they, they, you should think of them more as local modes, modes which are defined near u equal to zero. There's some local degree. I mean, that the degrees of freedom which I'm, which I'm trying to extract from a small region of space. Okay. 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 Uh, so maybe some of these questions will become more clear when we uh, when we do do this uh, do this computation. Let me emphasize that uh, these modes. Uh, E depend on a choice of point, which we're keeping tacit, right? So uh, I've been saying we introduce these coordinates, uh, u, u and v, and we said, you know, uh, we define these modes, but you could go to some other point somewhere else in space and define some similar modes. Uh, so we are not specifying in this definition, uh, this dependence on this origin. Uh, we're keeping, we, we keeping it implicit just to keep the notation light. Uh, second, they also depend on omega naught. This is also going to be something that I'm going to keep uh, tacit. Uh, I won't write it every time, but please remember when I write these A's and A tildes, they're going to depend on this omega naught. The reason to call this omega naught is because we'll differentiate it from all other frequencies. So this omega naught is just whenever we write down A and A tilde, and we don't write down uh, some uh, you know some uh, frequency. Uh, just remember that the frequency that appears is omega naught. This omega naught, remember, is something that appears here. Okay, so we see there's an omega naught that appears here, which you can see, and uh, I, you know, on the on the on the left hand side, I wrote it here, but uh, I will usually not 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 write this omega naught. Okay, so I'll just write a and a tilde. But please remember, there is an omega naught sitting there. Okay. Okay. 
So let's compute now, uh, as I said, you know, I've been talking about disentanglement. Let's compute the two point function A and A tilde. Okay. So uh, we want to compute this, this two point function between A and A tilde. And the nice thing we are going to find is that it depends only on the short distance field correlator. And that's kind of guaranteed, right? Because, you know, we, we had so much discussion right now about how these modes are defined close to the horizon. And so it's clear that, you know, when I compute this two point function, uh, it's going to depend only on the short distance correlator of pi with itself, uh, uh, which we discussed yesterday uh, uh, to some, you know, in great detail. Okay. So uh, let's just take the, the expression that we had uh, for these modes and substitute it. Uh, and we'll go through some calculation. As I said, the calculation might look a little ugly, uh, but in the end, we're going to get a very nice answer. Okay, so let's let's just write down uh, what we have. So a a tilde. Okay. Uh, first, there are some factors. There's a factor of pi. Remember, these things were sitting inside the square root. Uh, so these things just came out here. Then there's a du one. There's a du two. one uh, so this is these are I'm just sub I'm not doing anything deep I'm just substituting uh, these integrals uh, that we had okay. so there's a y1 then there's a du2 phi u2 v equals minus epsilon y2 uh, and I need to close let me see if I can do that this is the advantage of working with a tablet Excellent. Okay, uh, so this is the correlator. And then uh, I have in addition an integral, uh, which I, I define Okay, uh, so it's it's some long and messy expression, uh, but uh, you know you shouldn't be scared of it because notice I haven't done anything deep. Uh, all I've done is you know I have I have two two degrees of freedom. A was defined in terms of the integral, so this is what goes into the definition. Um, this is what goes into the definition of A. This is what goes into the definition of A tilde. And you know there were all these other integrals, right? This went into A, this went, this came from A tilde, this came from A, this came from A tilde, right? This came from A, this came from A tilde. This is product of prefactors, right? So there's nothing deep here at all. I've just taken my definition that I had of A and A tilde and just inserted them into a correlator. And these underlines I've made are just pointing out where uh, each of these terms in the expression came from. Okay, so some of them came from A, some of them came from A tilde, uh, but if you just sit down and do it yourself, if you just copy uh, the expression on the previous board uh, uh, onto this board, uh, you will see that you know, this is what you get. So it's pretty simple. Okay, okay. but now, uh, you know, we had something, uh, uh, we had something pretty nice uh, because remember that we spent a lot of time yesterday discussing this correlator. Okay, so there's only one quantum correlator in this whole expression. This, the quantum correlator in this expression is this one. Right? So, so notice there's a quantum correlator between the green lines, okay? and that's the only quantum correlator. The rest of it are just some C number functions with which I'm doing an integral. But we spent a lot of time discussing what that quantum correlator was yesterday. And remember what that quantum correlator was, was going to give you a delta function in Y1 minus Y2. So it was going to equate Y1 and Y2. So we'll get a delta function. And remember, we are doing a, an integral of y1 and y2 over a region, which is wall, okay? uh, but we are dividing by one over wall. Okay? So you see, once if you do this and you just substitute the expression we had from last time, we'll get something very nice. And what we're going to get is this. I'll just write down and you should see why, why we get this. Right. 
Um, so I hope you can see the, the last line on, on the tablet. You might, um, I hope everyone can see that. Uh, generally, can we see the last line or is the last line not visible? Okay. Yeah, it is, it is, it's, okay, it's fine. Thanks. Okay, so you know, the last line, uh, you see we had some ugly expression, we had some correlator, but this is the correlator we spent a lot of time discussing yesterday, right? And remember, what is this correlator? This correlator that, you know, because we, we are taking V to be much closer than all other scales, it's just one over U1 minus U2 the whole squared, and then you combine these factors of U2 and U1 into one power of I omega naught, and then we have these T of U functions. And all the prefactors have also become nice, uh, because, you know, uh, remember there was a delta function in the transverse directions. So that allowed you to collapse the two transverse integrals into one integral. Uh, you do that integral, you get a factor of VOL, which precisely cancels off the prefactor in the beginning. Then there are some additional prefactors, which are one over four pi squared omega naught, which we're going to need. Okay? So you see already we are seeing how uh, in this limit, uh, this two point function is becoming nice and simple. And now I'll show you how it becomes even simpler. So the next task is we want to do this integral that we have, okay? So we have this integral, which is one by U1 minus U2 squared, integrated with some U, U2 by U1 to the I omega naught, and then integrated with this smearing function, okay? So how do we do this integral? Okay, so well, I think there's a question about yeah. the I, I, I epsilon prescription. Like... Yeah, thank you. Uh, notice that in this setup, U1 is negative and U2 is positive. So we don't actually need to bother about the I epsilon prescription. Uh, there's in fact an assignment question uh, where if you try and compute a dagger, you will need to be careful about the I epsilon prescription. Uh, so I did write down the I epsilon prescription yesterday, but for what we are doing right now, we don't need it because U1 is, as I said, U1 is negative, U2 is positive. So even though we have one by U1 minus U2 squared, uh, that expression is never going to go to zero. Okay. Uh, uh, we are evaluating this correlator and the limit of epsilon going to zero. Uh, we are taking epsilon to be much smaller than every other scale. We're keeping epsilon fixed, but we're taking epsilon to be much smaller than every other scale. You can think of it in, as being evaluated in the limit of epsilon going to zero. Thank you. Is the choice of T of your kind of gate choice? No, uh, not really. Uh, it's, uh, it's just some smearing function, which is, a, it's not really a gate choice. It's just something that's meant to make things die off smoothly. Uh, you know, define some integral, some mode with compact support. Okay, so uh, now let me tell you how to do this integral. You know, the, the, the formula we need is actually the following formula. It's a formula for how you do Fourier transforms of things like this. Okay, and it's a nice formula. It's kind of useful even otherwise. Okay, so I'm going to write down an identity. Okay, and this is true, uh, as I said, in the limit where we are right now, which is when u1 is smaller than zero and uh, u2 is larger than zero. If it's not the case, uh, you'll need to be careful about some minus signs and so on, uh, but there, there are similar identities you can write down for other cases, okay? So this is an identity. Uh, how do we see uh, that this identity is true? Okay, how do we prove this identity? Uh, so this is actually telling you how to do the Fourier transform of something like one over u1 minus u2 squared. Uh, so to see this identity, uh, assume, okay, assume that that mod of u1 is larger than mod of u2. Okay, so let's say it was the case that mod of u1 was larger than mod of u2. Uh, then uh, notice that this expression, okay, mod is which is u2 divided by mod of u1, uh, is something which is always uh, smaller than one. Okay, therefore we should pick up the poles at omega so we can close the omega contour and pick up poles at at omega equal to plus i n. If you pick up a pole at omega equal to plus i n, you see the minus i n to the i becomes a positive number. And so you get u2 by u1 uh, to the power n. And the reason there is a pole at omega equal to i n is because of this factor. Okay. Notice this factor, one minus e to the minus two pi omega goes to zero at ome as omega goes to i n. So this integral has poles at omega equal to plus i n. It also has, well, n is an integer, by the way. 
It also has poles at omega equal to minus i n. Uh, but in the case when mod of u one is larger than mod of u two, the way we should do this integral is here is the complex omega plane. Uh, this is real part of omega. This is the imaginary part of omega. Okay. Uh, and there are these these poles uh, which are sitting in this expression at i two i three i and so on. Okay. There are also poles in the negative axis. Uh, and we are doing this integral. This integral is actually defined initially. The initial contour of integration is defined this way. Uh, but when u1 is larger than u2, uh, we need to pick up the poles in the positive omega plane, and we complete the contour by doing this. Okay. And you can see that the edges of the contour don't. You know, this curved part doesn't give any contribution, and therefore the entire integral is just given by summing the residues at these poles. Now, what are the residues at these poles? You know, the residues at the poles are are pretty simple. So the integral just becomes. Uh, you can maybe I can I can actually copy it. One second, let me just copy this. Uh, so we had this integral, and remember, I said we are picking up. You know, we are doing this integral by closing the omega contour, as I explained previously. Uh, when you pick up uh, these poles at omega equal to plus i n, notice there's actually no pole at omega equal to zero, and that's because of this omega factor. Okay. So notice there's no pole at omega equal to zero. The poles start at omega equal to i and two i and so on. And when you pick up these 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 poles, what you get is this: just you just get one by mod of u one, u two, sum of n equal to one. So no. No pole at n equal to zero. Okay. Um, to the power n. Okay, uh, this factor comes from a combination of the two pi i, okay, multiplying with the i from the omega. Okay, so the fact that you get a minus n comes from here. Uh, this e to the minus pi omega is what's giving you the minus one to the power n, and then you have u two by u one uh, to the power n, and this is summed from n equal to one to infinity. Okay, and this uh, just happens to be for the case when u one is smaller than zero and u two is larger than zero, it's just one by u one minus u two squared. Okay, and that uh, is uh, is is the reason uh, that we had this expression, which was this. Okay? So this is what we we proved right now. Of course, uh, there's another case you need to consider, which is the case when u1 is mod of u1 is smaller than mod of u2. In that case, you need to complete the contour in the other way, but you will find the same answer for that case as well. And that uh, I won't do that explicitly, but you can easily check that that's the case, and that's what gives rise to this expression. Okay. Uh, so, are there any questions about about this integral? Um, uh, how do we address the pole at omega equals zero? Uh, notice there's an omega in the numerator. Look here. Oh, so it's not a pole. Okay. There's no pole at omega equal to zero. Okay. Okay. Very good. So now, um, uh, let's just go back to where we started from. So if I if I go back to this uh, to this integral, right? Remember, I had this was the integral I wanted to do. So this was the integral I wanted to do. I told you how you could write one over u one minus u two in terms of a Fourier transform, right? Uh, so this integral uh, is is nothing but the integral of one by four pi squared omega naught du one by u one du two by u two. Uh, so I'm,
Okay, notice what has happened here. Uh, this expression, uh, you know, this omega e to the minus pi omega, I got just using the Fourier inversion theorem, right? You see, we, we were able to write one over u1 minus u2 as a Fourier transform, right? We wrote it as some integral and you can use the Fourier inversion theorem. So I've just written one over u1 minus u2 squared using this identity that I had previously, okay? Uh, and then we have, these expressions are just coming from here. I just copied them, okay? Um, Uh, just one second. Uh, yeah, sorry. And there's a d omega which is missing. Okay, very good. Uh, so now notice what happens. You see this t of minus u, okay, and and this uh, t of u two. Uh, look at what we are, what we are computing here. You see what we are computing here is now the Fourier transform of t of minus u one with respect to u one to the i omega naught minus omega. If you just look at the u1 integral, it looks like t of minus u1 right, into 1 over minus u1 into i omega naught minus i omega du1 by u1. Okay, Those are the only expressions that appear for t of minus u1. Uh, there's a similar expression that appears for t of u2. And this expression is just u2 to the i omega naught minus i omega the u2, okay? Uh, so this is actually nothing but the Fourier transform of t of u with respect to log of u, okay? Notice uh, there was a question earlier about why we were talking of t of u in terms of log of u. You see that what you have here is nothing but the Fourier transform of t of u with respect to log of u, okay? So this is just e to the i log of u2 okay, into omega naught minus omega into d of log of u2, right? So this is just the Fourier transform of t of u2 with respect to log of u2 and same for this, okay? So therefore, this integral that we have, uh, so starting from this integral that we have, we copy this, We're actually coming to the end of our calculation. I just wanted to do this carefully. Okay. This integral is something very simple. It turns out to be just one, if you just put in all the factors together, it turns out to be one over omega naught. Okay, into the mod square of the Fourier transform of T of U. Okay, uh, where this S is, is, is basically the Fourier transform of this function T of U. Okay, so this S is the expression we saw previously. And what we find here is that the integral we want uh, becomes something nice and simple, uh, which is what I've underlined, okay? Okay, so now the significance of what we were saying about uh, the form of T of U. Okay. Remember I said the T of U has a property that it's flat for a very large range of U. Okay. Because T of U is flat for a very large range of U, you know that it's Fourier transform for a very large range of log of U, you know that it's Fourier transform, S must be very sharply peaked about nu equal to zero. The Fourier transform has to be very sharply peaked about nu equal to zero. Let me draw it better. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is my Fourier transform, which has to be very sharply peaked around nu equal to zero uh, because of the assumption we made about t of u, which is it was flat for a large range of log of u. Okay. And therefore, uh, we find that this expression that we have here just picks up the contribution from near omega equal to omega naught. It's an integral over omega, but this integral is dominated by its contribution from near omega equal to omega naught. And we find a very nice answer, which is actually the only answer we are ever going to need, which is that A, A tilde 
is equal to e to the minus pi omega naught by one minus e to the minus two pi omega naught, okay? Plus dot, dot, dot. And these dot, dot, dots depends, for instance, on the fact that, you know, T of U is not exactly flat. And so therefore, mod of S squared is not exactly a delta function. Uh, but those are terms that we are never going to need. Uh, we're just going to assume that, you know, uh, those corrections are smaller than all other corrections that we're interested in, okay? So the final answer that we have for the two-point correlator uh, just comes by, you know, taking the integral that we have, I remind you, which is this integral, and just picking up the contribution near omega equal. So when you said omega equal to omega zero, notice that all the omegas here turn into omega zeros. This omega zero cancels off with this omega zero. Notice these two cancel, okay? And therefore, the thing you have is just this. So this is the final answer, which as I said, uh, is very nice. And even though we took a long detour and a long calculation to try and get it in some rigorous way, uh, this does indeed now give us the two point function of modes, which live on opposite sides of the horizon and have a particular universal entanglement. And we have derived now the form of this entanglement. Okay, let me just say a few more things and then I'll stop for questions. Uh, there are similar calculations, which one can do, uh, which, uh, uh, we will not do, but there's some assignment questions and they're almost identical uh, to what we had, which give us the following two point functions. Okay. Not, so you can also compute the, the two point function of A tilde with A tilde dagger. Remember now these two point functions involve the I epsilon prescription will be important because you're computing two point functions of now fields on the same side of either U larger than zero, U smaller than zero, uh, but it's a pretty uh, straightforward computation. And remember, as I already said, that A, A tilde is equal to zero. Uh, and you can, in fact, compute the commutator of A and A dagger and A and A tilde dagger, uh, sorry, A tilde and A tilde dagger. And the way we've normalized things, we find this. Okay. Okay. So, the reason we did this long song and dance was actually just to get the results that are now uh, present in this blackboard. And these are the only results we're going to need. Okay. Uh, let me uh, uh, say that, you know, it's, we really have simple harmonic degrees of freedom. Uh, these modes that we extracted, they commute with their conjugates uh, and really give you one. They don't give you a delta function. Okay. So often when you look at quantum field theories, uh, we write down creation and annihilation operators. Uh, which have some commutation relation that looks like a of omega a dagger omega prime is delta of omega minus omega prime here we have something that's really one simple harmonic oscillator and a tilde is another simple harmonic oscillator and these simple harmonic oscillators have some very simple two-point functions uh, both with each other and with themselves okay uh, and uh, a and a tilde commute uh, uh, with each other so that you know you can think of them as distinct simple harmonic oscillators okay uh, so that it was a long calculation on which we spent uh, almost one hour uh, but uh, the final answer that we are going to need, we, we will not uh, make reference uh, anymore to these, uh, or, uh, or we'll not make too much reference anymore to these smearing functions. The final expression that we are going to need uh, is just what is written on the board. Okay, uh, so this, as you can see, is a nice expression. We, can, we are going to say a little bit more about uh, this expression, uh, but before that, maybe I can stop and ask if there are questions. Yeah, I think there's a question by Pavan asking, what do the dot, dot, dot look like in the topmost equation? Yeah, so the dot, dot, dot depend on the details of the smearing function. You know, if you were to take a particular choice of smearing function, like if you were to, you know, choose some particular smearing function, you would get some particular form of the dot, dot, dot. Okay. So this is the universal part, which only depends on the properties of the smearing function that we demanded, which is the T of U is flat over a large range of log of U. Uh, but then there are other terms which will depend on the details of the smearing function, which we are never going to make reference to. We'll just assume they're small. And, you know, the, the point is that, in the regime that we want to work in, where the curvature scale is very large, separated from the UV scale, you can make these dot, dot, dots as small as you like, because you can make T of U flat over a very large range of log of U, and therefore, you know, you can make these dot, dot, dots basically irrelevant, and we will not need them in any, in any form. It is important in some sense that they are there, okay? We can never make them exactly zero, uh, but, uh, you know, to a good approximation, uh, the expressions on this board hold. Uh, I should say that, you know, if you want to be really careful, you should be careful and you should write down these dot, dot, dots every time and point out that these expressions are approximate and hold, you know, to the extent that we have idealized this smearing function, but uh, we will not need uh, the details of that anymore. Okay, are there other questions? Yeah, 
Uh, this dot 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 is uh, characterized by uh, the curvature scale, right? Because that's what restricted the smearing function. It also depends on the choice of t of u. You know, this dot 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 depends. You see, this dot, this thing came from here. Uh, so it came from this Fourier transform, and to the extent that the square of this Fourier transform looks like a delta function, uh, which was, uh, you know, when we normalized the smearing function to be integral of t of u squared to be one, we also normalized the integral of s of omega squared to be one. Uh, but you know, s of omega doesn't. Is not you know it has some width about omega equal to zero, and this dot 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 is going to pick up some of that width. So there'll be some term which will come from the leading term, and then we'll pick up some additional contributions, and those will depend on how exactly you chose s and how exactly you chose t. But we you know we don't want to talk about that. We we'll just make it yeah. We can make it as small as oh, we like. Isn't there a normalization issue because uh, because is if t is ideally flat, then uh, s itself should be a delta function. Yeah. So uh, remember the normalization we wrote down. Uh, which was here, uh, somewhere in the beginning. I wrote down the normalization. Let's see. Yeah, here. So you know, it's the integral of t of u squared with d of log of u is two pi. That tells you if you take the Fourier transform of t with log of u, then the integral of s of omega squared d omega is one. So it's actually not that s of omega is a delta function, but in fact that the integral of s of omega squared is one. And the fact that t of u has this form tells you. It's also true that s of omega is sharply peaked around omega equal to zero, but it's actually the integral of s of omega squared, which is one, uh, with this normalization that we have on the board, which you can see here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank there's you. this Pasteur's theorem that tells you that the far spectrum of uh, the function as Fourier transform, uh, you know, if you integrate them, you get the same answer. And that's what you need. Yeah. Okay. So okay, so so we had lots of complications, but that was just to try and get these answers in some rigorous way. Okay, we could have just written down these answers in the beginning, and in fact, often when people have these discussions, they say, "Oh, you know, we have these short distance modes, and the short distance modes are entangled in a particular way." And at least I always used to find it confusing, you know, because it was, and you know, sometimes you start wondering, you know, is there some subtlety there? And so the reason to do this calculation was to make all of this very precise. And to point out there, the short distance modes that have this two-point function. I'm going to say a little bit more. We can actually say something a little bit more about these guys. Yeah, actually, so sorry. There are a couple of raised hands as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, please go on. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, you may ask your question. Um, hello. Uh, can you say what happens with the, with the relation written on the last blackboard when these operators are evaluated for different values of omega zero? Ah, thank you. A excellent. I was just about to say that. Thank you for asking the question. So uh, indeed, uh, you know, we should, dif thank you very much. Uh, that's exactly, so as I said, you should, you know, we should differ. So sometimes in quantum field theory, you might define modes which have some property like this, right? Which look like e to the minus pi omega prime by one minus e to the minus two pi omega with a delta of omega minus omega prime. Okay, this is not what we have. What we have is not this. We do not have a delta function. Okay. Nevertheless, it is the case that the modes that we have are smeared about omega naught. Okay. So it is the case that if you were to look at A uh, defined with respect to omega naught, uh, let me insert the omega naught and let's call it now, since you already have a B, let's call it C, which is defined with respect to omega naught prime. This would be zero, okay, provided omega naught. So once again, the width of these modes is controlled by the precise smearing function that we have. Okay? But these modes are kind of discrete modes. Okay? So it's true that they have some finite width. You can think of them as, smear, as taking one of these B omega modes and smearing it a little bit in frequency, but by a small amount. Uh, the precise amount that you smear it by is controlled once again by you know, how large uh, your smearing function is. Uh, but these are like like some smeared versions of these modes which have delta function commutators, which have delta function two point functions. Uh, so here we just have a two point function that doesn't have this. Okay, it just has a one, uh, and indeed that means that you know if you take two frequencies which are very close to each other, like if you take on this board, omega naught and omega prime to be very close to each other, you won't get zero exactly. But provided you always talk about frequencies which are separated by by some amount which is larger than the small frequency that you smeared over, uh, you will get zero. So we don't have, uh, in some sense, a, uh, a, a continuous delta function, but you can think that we have a discrete delta function, provided you discretize the frequencies by some amount which is larger than this width of the smearing function, or the scale which is set by the width of the smearing function. Now, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you.
Okay, thank you. Um, uh, how do we see that if the frequencies are too different, we'll get zero? Yeah, uh, you can just redo the computation actually. So um, uh, you will see it. Um, um, yeah, uh, you know, if you, so here it was important that you got S of omega minus omega naught squared. Uh, if you were to, if you were to just redo this computation and put in here, uh, so, you know, in many places, uh, we, we combined U2 by minus U1 to the I omega naught. If you just put in different frequencies, uh, you will see that, you know, you won't get this nice mod squared expression that you have here, uh, which is what led to the one. So you okay. can, you, um, you'll see that you, yeah, know, you get something you, zero. I think it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was uh, it so that, yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, can you comment on the, now that we have done this computation uh, carefully, yeah. Can you comment on the validity of uh, uh, the UNRU calculation in a local region in uh, curved space? Because U to the power I, I omega looks like the UNRU mode, yeah. but you have used this ultra locality and you have gone to uh, a two dimensional uh, space, yeah. Yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so what can we say about the validity of that calculation now? I mean, that calculation is correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can think if, if you really had, I mean, if you really had flat space, like the space was just everywhere flat, then, you know, these modes would right. in fact become the UNRU modes. A's and A tildes would, would become like slightly smeared UNRU modes. Uh, they would be, mm -hmm. they would be discrete. I mean, they, you can think of A and A tilde as being just slightly smeared UNRU modes or a slight frequency. So if space was just everywhere flat, these things would become the UNRU modes. If space is not everywhere flat, as in the black hole case, you know, it'll be important. They'll become some nice modes in the black hole as well. Uh, but these A's and A and A tildes, you know, you can relate them to global modes. In the case when space is flat, these are actually the UNRU modes, the slightly smeared UNRU modes because they're not delta function normalized. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, and I think there's a question in the chat as well by- Yeah, yeah. Uh, I should see the question. Yeah, it, it might be better if you see it here. The number operator looks similar to the excitation. Uh, is there any excitation? I think the, the answer is, uh, is, the, is, is what we just said. You know, these are, you should think of these as like some local versions of the UNRU modes. So it's not so much, you know, in the black hole case, these modes will in fact turn out to be dynamical modes, but just the fact, I mean, maybe that's another point I should have emphasized. Just the fact that you have a thermal expansion, which is indeed correct. That's the observation is correct. That these correlators look like they're thermal. It doesn't tell you there's actually any flux because these correlators are defined very close to the horizon. There's no, it doesn't mean that if you go far away, there's actually any flux. It just tells you that there are these degrees of freedom which are entangled and they could have been UNRU modes. You know, in the black hole case, it will turn out that these two point functions will lead to flux, uh, but just by themselves, uh, they don't they don't imply that there's any flux if you go far away. So they don't necessarily imply a dynamical uh, flux if I understood the question correctly. The other question was, what is C omega? Uh, C omega was just, I just wanted just to disambiguate from A. Sorry, I, I already wrote. Uh, it, it's just A defined for a frequency omega not prime. I didn't want to use A. Uh, I could have used A as well, since I was writing the frequencies in the subscript. Okay, uh, so I hope that answers that question as well. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Sorry, okay. yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's one more asking, can you comment on the range of omega naught? The range of omega naught. Uh, we didn't put in any range of uh, omega naught. You know, uh, in, in principle, uh, omega naught can vary over a, over a large range. Uh, it is important that omega naught is appearing with respect to e to the i omega naught log of u. Okay. Uh, so there is some, uh, you know, in any real physics problem, uh, there's some range over which you can take log of u, which is in fact the, the ratio of the uv scale to the curvature scale. And there is some, you know, there's some omega naught, uh, that's some lowest value of omega naught that's set by that, by how large you can take a log of u. And you can't take omega naught to be, to be smaller than that. But you know, we haven't right now uh, said anything about the range of omega naught. It's just some number, some parameter that appears. Okay, I think that's it okay. for now. Okay, great. Yeah. So let me say, let me say a, a couple of things. Uh, uh, one thing I want to say is about, uh, you know, we define we define these modes uh, in the in the vicinity of a point. Okay. Uh, in fact, at times it is, we can sometimes deal with. We might have, or we might have. a space-time with spherical symmetry. Okay. And what that means 
is that the metric looks like minus du dv plus r naught squared into d of omega d minus one squared plus dot dot dot. These are terms relevant away from away from uv equal to zero. Okay, so it might happen that you have a space time that has this form. So so far we've said you know we we're trying to in, do some integral or some transverse directions and integrate only over a small range in the transverse directions. But you know it might be that in fact there is some symmetry in the space time so that the metric looks like this. Okay. Uh, there's nothing that guarantees that the metric has to look like this, right? You know, in the previous case where we were defining these modes in the vicinity of the point, it was guaranteed that the metric had to look like that in the vicinity of any smooth point on the manifold. Uh, here it's not guaranteed, but it might so happen, and it will in fact happen for all black hole space times with spherical symmetry, that we can find some, some sphere in the space time so that near that sphere, the metric looks like this. Okay? If so, if we can find such a sphere, then we can define an analog of the modes that we defined previously, uh, which now look like this. Uh, I'll just write down what the expression is. Uh, which are now where, you know, rather than doing the integral in the transverse directions over a small region, which is of volume VOL, uh, you could do the integral over the entire sphere and you do the same thing in the u and v coordinates. Okay. And except when you integrate in the sphere, I've integrated with a spherical harmonic. And here, when I write L, I include, you know, not only the, uh, I include also the magnetic quantum number. Okay. So in general, in D minus one dimensions, uh, the spherical harmonics are not just labeled by L, uh, but uh, you know they're labeled by some set of numbers. But here I'm just—I just mean you take some basis of functions in the sphere, and then you extract by integrating uh, the field with one of those basis of functions on the sphere. Okay. And similarly, we can define an a tilde, which looks like this. Um, it's exactly the same thing, except that in the transverse directions, uh, we don't integrate over a small region, but we integrate over the entire sphere. Uh, you have to be careful, by the way, that if you integrate with YL star here, notice there's a star here. Actually, I have this laser pointer. Let's see. Yeah, there's a star here, and there's no star here. Okay. So please uh, notice that. Um, okay, and this is the conjugate spherical harmonic. Now these modes, uh, these spherical modes now depend not on a point, but they depend on omega naught. Uh, so these spherical modes depend on, on omega naught and L. Uh, but it's not important because they obey exactly the same relations that we had previously, right? Provided you, you look at them at the same value of omega naught and same value of L, uh, they have precisely the same two-point function that we wrote down previously. And same for the self-correlators as well. So this is a minor technical addition to what we did, although in fact, in practice, we will often use uh, precisely uh, these spherical modes uh, and uh, not these modes which are defined in the vicinity of the point. And the way we normalize things, uh, these modes again satisfy this. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I've done right now is I just made, I, I just, I said, you know, we, we did these integrals and we define things in the vicinity of a point, but in fact, you could also do the integral in the vicinity of a sphere, right? So you could do the integral by doing some integral like this. Uh, in this review, I tried to do some 3D figure. Uh, okay. So this is the support of A. Uh, this is, you can think of this as a, as a as as a u equal to v equal to constant cross section, so this is the support of a, uh, and then uh, in fact the uh, support of v is something similar, uh, but inside the sphere. 
Oops, no, no, it should be this yellow. Okay, so I'm integrating very close to the sphere, uh, like for a very small range of u, uh, but I'm integrating with some, uh, I'm sorry, my, this looks like some spider or something, but I'm integrating uh, with very close to u, but this is this is my 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 sphere. I'm integrating for a small range of u outside the sphere and a small range of u inside the sphere, uh, and uh, I, I'll get these modes a and a tilde. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't do a better job drawing things, but uh, the precise expression is is this one, and it looks very similar to the expression we had previously, except that I have changed uh, this and I have made this uh, you know d omega, and I have changed this into a spherical harmonic. Uh, same here. And so, uh, and in, you know, I, I'm anyway suppressing uh, the fact that these modes depend on a point, but here they depend on this angular uh, momentum. Okay. Okay. Fine. Um, but any uh, questions about question. that? I want to say one more thing before we end this lecture. Uh, here, doesn't this mean the topology doesn't play a role in the correlator of A and Attila? Uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, it looks like a new corona strain. Uh, okay. Hopefully not. Uh, but uh, the the other question is, yeah. So you know, in in previously, I was I did emphasize at some point that you know the global properties of these transverse coordinates were not important to us, and that was indeed the case until about two blackboards previously, that you know we were integrating in the vicinity of a point. Then at some point, to make this argument, I made this assumption. You know, this assumption is not guaranteed to us, right? It's not guaranteed that the metric has to have this form. It might so happen that there is some symmetry, and so the metric does have this form. Like there is some surface u v equal to zero, so that the metric looks like this about that surface. Uh, but if it is the case, then about this surface at u at u v equal to zero, uh, we can define uh, these kinds of modes. And here I did indeed use some specific assumption about uh, the global properties of these transverse coordinates in that they compactified into a sphere. By the way, they could have been planar, and you could have defined similarly instead of integrating with the spherical harmonic. Uh, you could have defined some plane waves and integrated with a plane wave here. I hope you can see this laser pointer. Uh, and you could have done that as well uh, if you had some planar transverse directions instead of spherical transverse directions. Uh, in everything in this course, we'll always talk about black holes which are spherical uh, rather than talking about planar black holes. And that's why I thought we should introduce this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, there are some more questions in yeah. the chat. Yeah. If you... Do we not have Kronecker? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do have Kronecker deltas. Uh, I am suppressing this dependence. Uh, we do have Kronecker deltas for omega. Uh, and so maybe my notation is not ideal, but I'm suppressing this dependence. Uh, but indeed, you know, it is the case that uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, if you if you take modes which are defined for different omega knots, like if you put in like omega not here and omega not prime here, and these are not the same. Uh, and if you put L and L prime, then you know, it is indeed, it is, you know, the reason I don't want to write down a Kronecker delta is that uh, we have the frequencies are not actually discrete. These are continuous parameters, right? Uh, but the point is that these modes don't click unless these omega naught and omega primes are sitting on top of each other. If they're separated by too much uh, and the scale of too much is set by the smearing function, then you would just get zero. Okay? So I don't want to write down a Kronecker delta because that would not quite be precise. Uh, but indeed, if you take modes which are separated by different frequencies or have a different L, uh, then oh, I can write in the L, I can write a Kronecker delta. That's fine. Okay, for the frequency, I probably shouldn't, uh, but indeed there's a delta LL prime, yes. And that you can see very clearly, it just comes from here. It just comes from the fact that, you know, if you had a YL and a YL prime, uh, you know, uh, you would just, if you took L and L prime to be different, you just get a zero on the sphere. Okay. So let me conclude with, with something which is, which is nice. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, we might conclude a little, or maybe we'll be just in time. So let me, so far we said something about two point functions, right? But uh, we can say something a little bit stronger uh, and uh, we can say something strong, you know, uh, and which is in some sense at the heart of this issue of, you know, the fact that these modes are in some sense maximally entangled. And we can say it, uh, something slightly stronger. Okay? So far we've been writing for correlators, right? But in any quantum mechanical theory, you know, I need to tell you what state I'm computing these correlators in, right? I'm not just allowed to write angular brackets. Okay? So it might be that, and later, you know, maybe we'll be in some full theory of quantum gravity, something which is described only by a boundary CFT. And there's some complicated state of the theory in which I'm doing these computations. Okay? So there might be some microscopic description of the, the metric and the geometry and so on. And maybe there's some complicated state 
But nevertheless, in that complicated state, I can define these effective fields and I can compute uh, these correlation functions, okay? So say we are in some state, in a state psi. And every place I was writing angular bracket, I should really have written expectation value in the state psi, okay? Uh, the state psi, I don't need any of its microscopic details. I just need the fact that, you know, it corresponds to a smooth geometry, uh, you know, and uh, it's a smooth state and therefore it has the right short distance two point functions. And once you do that, you can derive, you can go through the entire machinery that we had and derive these modes which are entangled correctly, right? Now, uh, what I want to show is that the action of A tilde on psi okay, is going to be proportional to A dagger on psi. Okay. This is much stronger than saying that A tilde has a two point function. Okay. You see psi is some state, the action of A takes you to a different state, right? If this is the state psi, you know, A psi is somewhere else. A tilde size, maybe something like this. Now, all I told you was that A tilde and A psi had some two point function, right? But it could have been that A psi was something like this, right? And they could still have had a two point function. See? But what I'm telling you is that this kind of picture is not allowed. And in fact, A tilde psi and A psi are parallel to each other. Okay? A, A tilde psi. Uh, is sorry, you know, a, a, a dagger psi could have been something else, but I'm, what I'm telling you is that a tilde psi and a dagger psi are in fact going to be parallel to each other, and they're not going to be different, but they're going to be sitting on top of each other. Okay. So that's a much stronger statement than saying that a tilde psi has a two point function, has some overlap with a dagger psi. Uh, I'm in fact telling you that they're going to be parallel. Okay. It's very simple to prove given the set of two point functions that we have, and uh, let's do that now. So say that A tilde psi uh, has this decomposition. Okay. Plus chi, where chi is orthogonal to A psi and A dagger psi. I can always make this decomposition, right? I have two vectors, I have a psi, I have a dagger psi, and I can always, you know, I have this vector a tilde psi, I can always take a tilde psi and I can write it as a psi plus a dagger psi and plus something else which is orthogonal to a psi and a dagger psi. Right? So, so far I haven't done anything. All I've said is I've decomposed this vector a tilde psi, which is on the left-hand side in terms of some vectors on the right-hand side. Okay? And, and, you know, that's, that's my decomposition. That's my definition of chi. Okay, now let's work out what these coefficients C1 and C2 have to be. Okay. Remember that psi, oh, I don't know if I emphasize this, but it is indeed the case that psi a dagger a tilde psi is equal to zero. Oh, this is something I, uh, I think I forgot to write down in my list of correlators, but you can easily check that a a tilde has a non-zero correlator. And in fact, a dagger and a tilde has a zero correlator. Now, because a dagger and a tilde has a zero correlator, okay, uh, we know that psi a dagger, a dagger psi is equal to zero. We also know that psi a dagger chi is equal to zero. Okay, that comes from here. Uh, these two correlators, I, I didn't write down, but uh, I can, sorry, I, I should have emphasized them more, but indeed you find by computation that A tilde have a non-zero two-point function, but A dagger and A tilde do not, and A dagger and A dagger do not. So A dagger squared in the state psi does not have a two-point function. So we have, you know, we find this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, okay? Now for all of this to be consistent with the expression we have on top, it must be the case that C1 is equal to zero. Uh, do you see that? Because if C1 was not zero, remember that psi a dagger a psi is not equal to zero, right? So if you just take this expression that you have here, this decomposition, where you see the laser pointer, and you insert it into the fact that psi a dagger a tilde is zero, okay? you can take this a tilde that you have here and you expand it out in terms of this expression. 
you see that one term you get in the expression is just this a dagger psi, but that doesn't contribute. So the fact that this is zero doesn't put any constraints on C2, but this is zero and this expression gives you zero. So the only contribution to this expression comes from here. And since this expression is zero, we see that C1 must be zero. Okay. So in fact, we can cross out this C1, this cannot actually appear. Okay. Okay. Now, what about uh, this expression uh, C2? Okay. You see, we do have also that psi a, a tilde psi, this is the correlator we spent some time deriving, is this, right? But once again, if you go back to this expression, let me copy it now. If you go back to this expression, uh, you see that psi a a psi is zero. Okay, so this C1 term doesn't contribute. So this correlator does not uh, constrain the C1 term, but in any case, the C1 term wasn't there as we knew from the previous correlator. Okay, so the only contribution to this correlator that we have on top, the only contribution to this correlator has to come from this term. It can't come from this term either because the sky is orthogonal to the action of A and Psi. Okay. So this correlator tells you that, remember that A, A dagger Psi is one by one minus E to the minus two pi omega naught. And this means that it must be the case that C2 is e to the minus pi omega naught. Okay. So we've derived now what C2 is, this has to be e to the minus pi omega naught. Okay. Now, what about this chi? You see, it must be the case. We also know what psi a tilde dagger a tilde psi is. And that is just e to the minus two pi omega naught by one minus e to the minus two pi omega naught. Okay. But, uh, you know, we know what psi a tilde a tilde dagger psi is. We can also compute that by plugging in this expansion that we have on this, this line here, right? So we can also compute this by plugging in the expansion. If you do that, you will find that that psi a tilde dagger a tilde psi is e to the minus two pi omega naught. This is coming from mod of C2 squared okay, into psi a a dagger psi plus chi chi. Okay. I just plugged in the expression I had for a tilde psi uh, and I took its conjugate and I just contracted those expressions together. But uh, you see, because this is e to the minus two pi omega naught, this term already gives you e to the minus two pi omega naught by one minus e to the minus two pi omega naught. Because remember, this expression that we have here, this one that I'm now pointing to, is just the denominator of this expression, right? This denominator is what this thing is. We have e to the minus two pi omega naught, which is the numerator. Therefore, the first term, this term here, which I circle with my laser pointer, is already giving you the full answer that you need. And therefore, it must be the case that chi chi is equal to zero. Okay. That means chi is equal to zero okay, if you're in a unitary Hilbert space. Okay. So we have found, we have proved, as we started to prove, that a tilde psi is e to the minus pi omega naught a dagger psi. And I emphasize that this is stronger than the fact that A tilde has a correlator with A. It's the fact that A tilde psi is parallel to the action of A dagger psi. Okay. And this constant of proportionality is this e to the minus pi omega naught. You can play a similar game with the other expressions. Uh, I won't uh, write down uh, all the other expressions, but you know, you will also find that A tilde dagger on psi is e to the pi omega naught A psi. Okay. So note the different sign. The sign here is a plus and the sign here 
uh, on top is a minus. Okay? Uh, these things are not actually asymmetric. If you were to take uh, this A and move it to the left, uh, you would get something that looks completely symmetric in A and A tilde. Uh, they just look asymmetric because I put A tilde here and A tilde dagger here. Okay? So this is stronger, this is stronger than just the two point functions. Then just psi a a twiddle two point function. Okay. Then just the value of this. Uh, and it arises because you put in also the other two point functions. Okay. So this arises as a consequence of all the two point functions taken together. It's stronger than any of these two point functions in isolation. Uh, but when you take all of these two point functions together, you find that in fact, you have this relationship between the action of A tilde on psi and the action of A on psi. And this relationship will be important for us. So these results are actually important results uh, that we're going to keep using. Uh, so please keep them in mind. Okay, okay. Uh, so I'll actually stop here since we are almost out of time and we can take a few questions. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to emphasize once more, just to just before we end, uh, that you know we did a lot of long calculations, but in the end, the answers that you need to remember are the boxed answer that you see here, and the two-point functions uh, that we uh, derived previously, uh, which were uh, which were here. Okay, so just th these, you know, all you need to remember at the end of these long calculations are these simple and very beautiful two-point functions. And the only reason to do these calculations uh, was to try and derive these two point functions rigorously and carefully and point out that you know, there's no subtlety, there's nothing we are brushing under the carpet. You can really extract these degrees of freedom. Uh, when I say they're entangled, I mean that they have these kinds of two point functions. Another way to say that they're entangled is this fact, is the fact that the action is what we had in the last board, is that the action of one mode on one side of this u equal to zero surface can be written in terms of the action of another mode on the other side of this u equal to zero surface. And this is something that I uh, remind you just came from demanding some very simple properties about the short distance behavior of the two point function. Uh, so from the next lecture, we'll now start applying this uh, to black holes uh, and understand how these very simple properties that hold in any space time uh, when applied to black hole space times uh, lead to a very robust and nice derivation uh, of Hawking radiation. Uh, but for now, uh, what we said was independent of black holes and in fact would hold in any space time. Uh, so I'll stop here and we can uh, have questions if there are.